On opening night, we could not wait to go see the new Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. As kids of the 80s and fans of the original movie, we have some thoughts. Today we're talking about the new Ghostbusters movie. Hey guys, I'm Abby. And I'm Keith. Welcome to our 80s Life podcast. We recently watched Afterlife first before we went and saw Frozen Empire. Just really quickly, if you had to pick a favorite, which one would it be? Definitely Afterlife. Okay, me too. Although I liked Frozen Empire, we liked it. But Afterlife was so good. Well, the storyline of Afterlife I thought was better. It was a bit more nostalgic. It was, definitely. I mean, it, it, you know, they both throw back to the original Ghostbusters, but the first one, Afterlife, definitely had a better connection with the OGs. Okay, I would agree with that, but I'm anxious to find out what other 80s kids think about that. Um, before we begin, though, I do want to give a brief spoiler alert just in case. We're going to try not to give away a lot of major plot lines or spoilers, but in talking about the movie and reviewing it, it's going to be nearly impossible to not give away some of the movie. So we'll try not to, but... We might you, slip up. Yeah, so if you don't want to hear any spoilers before you see the movie, then wait until you watch the movie before you listen to the entire show. And then come back and see if you agree with us. Yes, I definitely want to know what you guys think. Okay, so I agree with you, Keith. I liked Afterlife slightly better, but both were great. I love the acting. I thought it was really well cast. They both had a lot of nostalgia, which I loved. There were some aspects in this one that were different than the first one, um, nostalgia-wise, so I liked that. And uh, overall, big thumbs up. Right off the bat, I just want to say it was a great movie. We really enjoyed it. Glad we went. Yeah, biggest change for me, the first one was set in Oklahoma. Yeah. And so this, I kind of liked that because we're from the area and we're from Kansas. So that's like Midwesty, but yeah, different. And this one was in New York City. But that was cool too, because it was nostalgic from the first original movie. And we saw some of the actual same places from the original movie, which I kind of loved that they were in the old hook and ladder fire station and all of that. So I could get behind that. The problem I had was they just opened it up in New York and all of a sudden they're all there. You know, all the characters from the movie, including some of the more minor characters, end up in New York. A little far-fetched and I would have liked them to build the story a little bit about how they got there and what had transpired over those two years. Because I was like, okay, did Gary marry the mom? They're obviously still together, but they never really told us. And he was kind of taken on a stepdad role, but they never officially said like they were married or anything. And it was just a little confusing from the get-go, I thought. So bottom line, we got questions. We have some questions. What happened in those two years? I feel like I, you know, missed a lot. And they jumped right into the action, which was fun. The opening scene was really fun. They're like ghost busting as a family. That's cute. Yeah. And some of the characters have really grown up in the last few years from the last movie. And that's happening whenever you have teenagers as the main characters. You're going to have some growth and some changes. Well, it's like podcast. I didn't even recognize him. I know. He's so cute, though. I really like him as an actor. I thought he was adorable, and I like his character, Oh, he too. was great. He just changed a lot. Yeah, it took me a minute to recognize. Because, again, it was like, okay, he's also in New York City. It was just weird. Like, what are they all doing there? And they sort of explain it, but... Not really. They just had to find a quick, easy way to get all the characters in one place again so they could have the same actors. But then the day, I thought it was cool they were back in New York City. Yeah, I did too. Okay, Keith, I know one of the things that we can both agree on that we loved about this movie was the nostalgia. We've already kind of talked about that. So some examples, and there were many, but some that stood out to me that I absolutely loved were um, the old clips from the 80s, including they had a little clip of the Ghostbusters commercial from the Ghostbusters serial. Remember that? Ghostbusters! What are you going to punch? Ghostbusters! Yeah, that was funny. It was so cute, and it was like the real thing, I, I believe. Um, so I loved the throwbacks. I loved how they interjected the Ghostbusters into pop culture similarly to how they were in real pop culture. I thought that was really cute. Like they had a serial, like they obviously were like, had experienced some, some fame 
back in the day, like they were heroes, right? They yeah, saved and, and the And they world. even, it looks like they even put some of the clips from the original Ghostbusters in there. Like some of the ce- celebratory clips, like when they were popular. Oh, yeah. And, you know, when they were popular and everyone loved them, that part of the movie, they showed some of those clips, uh, you know, when they're reminiscing about the old days. Yes, I totally loved that. They did that a little in the first one, but more so in this one. And of course, the references to the ghost from the original one well who came back finally i was so disappointed he wasn't in afterlife oh, me too and he finally made an appearance were you gonna tell him slimer slimer we love seeing slimer even though he's still just as gross as ever um we See, didn't get a lot of resolution with slimer though like i would have liked more action hey but slimer kind of helped him out yeah he did and he was cute and like goofy it was great um, we also saw a return of the library ghost, just a brief cameo of the library ghost. And we also saw, of course, more Stay Puft Marshmallow references and those cute little ones from the afterlife returned to this movie as well. Do you think they'll ever do a spinoff just with those little guys, like a cartoon or something? Wouldn't that be fun? It would be fun. I, I don't I don't think they will, though. You I don't? Think, I mean, they're give, they've given them a lot of nods in both these movies. I think they are one of the things that is meant to appeal to kids because it's not really a kid's movie per se. This movie is PG-13, which we'll talk about, but you know kids are going to go to it and they love those little guys. I know I did, so I still love them. They're so cute. Um, And then they also had a really nice nod to the Ray Parker Jr. original song. It was featured prominently in the movie, which we love. And, of course, we just met Ray Parker Jr. on the 80s cruise. We did. And we got to go to a meet and greet. We got this record signed by him. And he put on a fabulous show, which he, of course, sang Ghostbusters. Let me tell you something. Person makes me feel good. Now, when asked in the Q&A if he ever got tired of Ghostbusters or being known for Ghostbusters, like, you know, he's not a one-hit wonder. He has a lot of other great songs. He's actually very talented. Check out his catalog and you'll recognize the songs. But he answered, absolutely not. I love that I'm known for Ghostbusters. I love the song, love the movie. And he even played for us his ringtone on his phone, which was the Ghostbusters theme, but he changed the words. Now, of course, if I had written Ghostbusters and sang Ghostbusters and I was still getting paid for Ghostbusters, yes, I would love it too. Yes, of course. I mean, that's his bread and butter, so he has to say that. But I, I feel like it was genuine and he really does like being known for that. So I thought that was cool because some of these artists, I think maybe they get tired of their big hits after a while, but he is not. Now you got to embrace what makes people love you. Yes. And he has definitely. Well, and like right after we got back from the eighties cruise, like a week later, he was on like all the late night talk shows, like Jimmy Fallon and stuff. Yeah, it was funny. That was great. They did like a acoustical uh, set. Ray Parker's playing the triangle. It was so cute, you guys. If you didn't see it, look it up. I think it's on YouTube, but um, definitely check that out. It was so cute. So we love the resurgence of popularity for Ray Parker Jr. If you're watching Ray, hi. (laughs) It was so nice meeting him. And one other throwback to Ray Parker was when Paul Rudd. Oh. He he verbally spoke some of the words in the sequence of dialogue that he had with Callie. That was hilarious. That was probably my funniest laugh out loud moment. And this movie had a lot of humor in it. A lot of people in the, our audience that we were watching it with were cracking up, but that part made me laugh the most. And then I cannot get over how much I love the Janine character played by Annie Potts. I've always loved Annie Potts as an actress. I used to love designing women. That was such a great show. I liked her little role in the Ghostbusters as Janine, the secretary But in this one, you guys, this is a spoiler. She gets to be a Ghostbuster at the end, and she gets a little uniform, and it just was the sweetest moment. I loved it so much. 
So I was excited for the return of Walter Peck. Oh, yes. William Atherton. If you remember back to the original Ghostbusters, he was an EPA agent, and he was trying to shut the Ghostbusters down. Well, fast forward to now the fifth installment. He is now the mayor of New York City, and he's still trying to shut the Ghostbusters down. (laughs) I mean, he always plays kind of a schmarmy bad guy in a lot of movies. I first saw William Atherton um, in one of my favorite 80s movies, Real Genius, where he played the sort of like dean of students, professor, bad guy. And remember at the end when they um, play the trick on him and they fill up his house with popcorn. That's classic. I love that so much. He was also in the best Christmas movie ever. Which is? Die Hard 1 and 2. Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> How could we forget the best Christmas movie? Now, we'll save that debate for another day because we know some of you guys want to debate us on that. That's probably another podcast. But overall, the movie was so fantastic. As we mentioned, lots of nostalgia. I thought the plot was really fast-paced, um, nicely paced. I thought it moved along quickly, and I I enjoyed the plot. I thought it was well-written. Um, okay, I, I have a little bit different point of view. Okay, what right. did you think? First of all, it was a two-hour movie, so, I mean, that's about as long as, in my opinion, a movie should be. But I thought when they got to the, really to the storyline of Garaka, the main bad guy in the movie, that it was kind of fast, and then the ending was kind of lacking a lot of action to me. I didn't feel that way. I thought there was plenty of action, but I'm also not a fan of action movies. So I, you know, enjoyed the storyline pieces more. There is something I do need to say about Garaka before we move on. He is way scarier than the bad guys in the other ones. So if you have young kids, like just be aware, like this is not the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man. This guy is scary and would probably give young kids nightmares, which I think is why the PG-13 rating. He probably could, but I still think even with PG-13, they could have built his character a little bit more, made him a little bit more scary, and still gotten away with PG-13. I think he could have been even scarier because he was mm. super creepy. But he never really talks. Like, he only speaks in this other language. Yeah. You don't get to hear him speak English. Yeah. But so he, he has no, like, his personality is lacking. Yeah, but when you just see him and he's big horns and he's spitting out ice. Yeah. Oh, I he's mean, menacing. I mean, he is menacing. He has these big, long claws. And he, like, he's, like, always doing And like those horn and things. The, yeah. I but mean, I miss the Stay Puff. Like, I liked the lightheartedness of Slimer and library lady and stay puff. And then when you get to this guy, he's like, he is downright scary. See, I like it a little dark. I mean, and same holds true with me for like Harry Potter movies. I like the later movies because it got super dark. Oh, okay. I and, like the earlier ones. You like the earlier ones. Yeah. So I could see why you like stay puff and those things. Whereas uh-huh. I liked creepy. That's so I- weird. Ice age dude. You know why that's weird? Cause you don't like horror movies and I do. If I go in and I know I'm watching a horror movie and it's not made for kids and there's not going to be other kids in the movie theater or anything like that, I love a good scare. But I don't like a movie that pretends to be like a kid's family-friendly movie and then scares the pants off the kids (laughs) and then the parents are trying to put them to bed at night and like they're having nightmares and stuff. Like that is not cool. I'm going to stand by my opinion, Garaka, too scary. Not It's fine for me. But I'm just saying for this franchise, I thought it was too scary. Garaka could have been a little bit more scary. Nah. I mean, this is not Stranger Things. Stranger Things should be scary. It's a scary horror movie. Anyways, my other thing about the plot, my only other, like, critique, I didn't love the storyline of Melody the Ghost. I want to say right up front, the actress that played her was great. And I loved the way Phoebe connected with her grandfather's ghost in Afterlife. I just thought it was weird. Like, did we need Phoebe to be hanging out with another ghost? Could she not, you know, have a different storyline than she hangs out with ghosts and plays chess? Like, I just thought it was sort of a weird add-on and maybe not necessary. That's just my opinion. Take it or leave it. I mean, I I don't know. I'm indifferent on it. I couldn't argue one way or the other on that one. I mean, I get why they did it. Phoebe wasn't allowed to ghost bust because she wasn't of age, which is also very silly. Then they had to, I guess, give her something else to do. I don't know. I just thought it was kind of weird how these two connected. Okay, so if we're talking about negatives, I have one major negative. 
Oh no, a major one? Well, it's, it's not major, a little disappointment. So, and it, it goes back to Afterlife as well. I really wanted to see the OG Ghostbusters more. Okay, I'll agree with that. Especially so, Bill Murray. Yeah, so in the first one, okay, I got it. They didn't show up till really the end, mm-hmm. and they helped save the day. But in this one, I really thought, since it was in New York City, that we were going to have more of the OGs and maybe less of the, the new characters, but it was still mostly the new characters with some sightings of the OG Ghostbusters. Yeah, I mean, they definitely were there. Dan Aykroyd had a much bigger role he did. than Bill Murray. So we should talk about Dan Aykroyd's uh, role because I really liked his character. I mean, obviously it's race dance. It's the same character, but they've sort of morphed him into this like YouTuber guy, this like amateur YouTuber, which of course we can identify with that. We thought it was hilarious because he didn't, he was trying to do YouTube, but he didn't really know how. And so he has podcast helping him. What was funny was he didn't know what to do in the part where he said, push the subscribe. It just cracked me up because he didn't know the lingo or anything. Like he's just this old man trying to do YouTube. All right, so, so to back up a little bit, Ray is a proprietor of oddities. Yes. And more specifically related to the occult. What he does, he kind of has like this antique roadshow of people that bring things that they think are possessed. Right. And then that, then he shows that on his YouTube channel. He uses the same meter, like the ghost meter that they showed in the original ones. And he holds the meter up to it. And supposedly, if there's a ghost trapped in the object, then the meter, you know, will show that. Um, and most of the time, they're not. And then he, they smack it with a hammer to get more views. Because podcasts like, this is what gets the views. Which that, I, that whole scene was so funny to me. But um, I did not like that storyline in one aspect. Because... If you are new to well, our channel. Well, it's because Abby is proprietor of oddities as well. <laughs> That's true. So if you're new to our channel, this is the part where we first need to ask you to be sure and subscribe because we have a lot of fun on here. But one of the things I do when we're not doing our podcast, this is just me, is I go to estate sales and I buy a bunch of 80s crap and then I show you guys what I found. I do these haul videos, right? But occasionally in the comments, people will say, aren't you worried that you know, this object will, you'll bring it home and it'll have a spirit attached to it or a ghost in it or something. And 0% never worried about that. That was never a thought until you guys all brought it up. Thanks a lot. (laughs) I don't believe in that. But then the whole premise of this movie becomes that the spirits are trapped in the objects. And then I'm like, oh crap, (laughs) could that actually happen? I, I still don't believe in it. But the movie makes it seem a little bit more like... It makes her, it makes her go, hmm. hmm. Yeah, I know. Like, should I be concerned? I did buy some things. I actually did go estate sailing today and brought home some beautiful Pyrex bowls. But yeah. I hope there's nobody's <laughs> grandma in there. Say it might be possessed by some, somebody's <laughs> Uncle Freddy. Oh, no. Okay, so anyway, I thought that was interesting that that was the premise and also a little creepy. That's it. I'm just going to go with it. But I still enjoyed Dan Aykroyd's character and especially the whole YouTube thing. Yeah. Bill Murray, Dr. Peter Venkman. You hardly see him. Yeah, we didn't see him until about halfway through the movie. And I kept wondering. I even whispered to you, where's Bill Murray? When are we going to see Bill Murray? He finally does show up and he's great at the end. He's great. But I did wish that he had been in more of the movie. And then we mentioned Annie Potts already. She had a bigger role this time which made me very happy. What about Ernie? We had Ernie Hudson. We had Winston. Winston. He's great. So Winston has done well for himself in life, and they alluded to that, I think, in Afterlife. Mm-hmm. But, you know, he's made a lot of money, and that's how they get the firehouse back because they actually show that at the very end of Afterlife. If you stayed yeah. through the end of the credits, it actually shows uh, Winston going back to the firehouse. So that's kind of where that one ends, and then the new one picks up that everyone's, like, in the firehouse. You know. Yeah, and so that was where we missed that whole two years of, like, what happened, what transpired. But they, they kind of quickly explained that the mom didn't have any money or whatever. They needed a place to live, and I don't know why they had to move to New York to do that. But Winston's like, you guys can stay at the firehouse. And the firehouse turns out kind of be a dump because it's been sitting empty for all this time, and it's, like, leaking. And then it turns out the ghosts are leaking a little bit, but we won't spoil that. But I think you saw that coming because at the end of Afterlife, they showed the little emergency light blinking and I was like, ooh, is that thing going to break? Because it's holding all the ghosts 
since 1984 or whatever. And so it's like, how long can it hold those ghosts? And what if somebody, what if the power goes out or something? So you'll have to watch the movie to find out. Yes, you'll find that out. So other characters in the movie, of course, Paul Rudd um, retains his role as Gary, Gary Gruberman. Is that right? That's right. You guys, when we were looking up information about the actors, we found out that he attended Kansas University. So we didn't even know he was a Kansas boy. He's a Jayhawker. That's so cool. So he's from our neck of the woods. Great acting as always. I love him in comedy roles. And even though this one isn't pure comedy, some of his lines are really funny. And he is really great at comedy. And then Carrie Coon, who plays Callie, the mom. As I mentioned, they didn't give us their relationship status. But we're, we're understanding they're still together. And that's about all we got. All of a sudden, he's making tacos. You know, we're, and we're just thrust into their relationship, not knowing what happened over the last two years. Are they engaged? What's going on? Um, and then we have the, the son, Trevor, played by Finn Wolfhart. And then the daughter, Phoebe, is played by McKenna Grace. So they, they all are the same actors from the last one and all fantastic. Yeah. Really, really great. Yeah, I thought the acting was really well done. I did too. I loved that the family is now ghost busting together because, you know, Keith, the family that ghost busts together stays together, right? Isn't that oh, what they say? I bet you've been waiting all day to say that. <laughs> Did you like it? I love it. <laughs> that totally has Abby written all over it. I just wish I had a drum set right now. Oh, yeah. We need to add like it on our soundboard. Hey. Oh, shoot. Well, we do have some sounds on there, apparently. There it is. Oh, there it was. There it is. Should we try it again? Okay. Hey, Keith. What? The family that ghost busts together stays together. Is that a mom joke? I think it was. Before we move on, I also want to point out, speaking of Ghostbuster family affair, look, we have our matching t-shirts, you guys. The family that matches together stays together. <laughs> or something. I don't know if that's, that doesn't sound right, but <laughs> uh, we actually got these for the 80s cruise to wear for Ray Parker Jr., um, and then it worked out perfect because we were like, oh, we can totally wear these to the movie theater. I mean, we were the only people dressed up in the movie theater. I was hoping people would show up in like full I, ghost busting I, suits. I fully expected for on opening night for people to show up in the gear. I know. Wichita, I'm kind of disappointed in you, honestly. Yeah. Like, where were the diehard fans? So the last time we actually saw a movie in our movie theater was Top Gun. That was a long time ago. I know. Well, we, we also have a podcast on that if you're interested. But yes, that was a long time ago. I mean, it's so infrequent that a movie plays that we actually want to go pay the money and watch it in the actual theater. I was about to say, I had to take out a small loan to go to that movie last night. We were disappointed in the prices. We were disappointed in the theater as a whole. That could be a whole other show. The theaters have really gone down. There was a whole bunch that were just empty. It's, it's, it's like they're in give up mode. They don't care anymore. <laughs> it's kind of sad. But we were happy to support Ghostbusters and also, of course, Top Gun. I mean, when it, a really solid 80s remake comes along, that'll get us to the theater. But that is not an indicator to other directors and producers out there. Don't go messing with our 80s movies. I don't love it when they remake them. But this one had the stamp of approval from all of the original Ghostbusters. So I'm okay with that. One thing that I did really like in this episode was the new gadget they had. They had a couple new gadgets, They had a couple actually. new gadgets. They had the new Proton Packs, but they had one gadget that really excited me. I think I know what it was. Was it the drone? It was a drone ghost trap. Yeah, that was cool. So last year, they our last movie with the Afterlife, they introduced the remote control car ghost trap, which is cool. And so they, that's, that still makes an appearance in this one. But the drone goes trap. That was cool. I was like, all right. So in addition to new gadgets, we also got some new characters. And there was one that we really loved. I really liked Nadim, the fire starter. He was hilarious. So he's played by Kamal Nanjani. I hope I said that right. Great actor. He did a fantastic job. He plays sort of like a junk dealer that's selling stuff. Um, he's hawking stuff that was belonged to his dead grandma. But he also sells stuff like probably hot Nike tennis shoes. <laughs> oh, yeah. He had stacks know, of shoes. Stacks of shoes. And he, he's selling anything that he can make a buck off of. Right. He, he was like slightly sketchy but lovable. And um, he's selling off his grandma stuff. And he accidentally 
cells like this ancient artifact that sets the wheels in motion and really he's the one that causes all this drama it's all his fault it is but in the end he also helps to resolve it and we won't spoil that aspect of the storyline but um it was just great. We really enjoyed him as a character. So I mean, thumbs up for let's, that. Let's face it. Every Ghostbuster movie has a nice, tidy ending. So. Well, I mean, we know what's going to happen. Like, yeah. you know, there's going to release a really bad guy, and then they're going to fight it. But um, but we won't get into too many details. And then we also saw the addition of Patton Oswalt as Ray's librarian friend, Hubert Wartsky. And we enjoyed the fact that they went down into the bowels of the library. I liked seeing the library ghost again, as I mentioned. And um, that was just a fun scene, I thought, at the New York library. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it, and it really tied the story together well. They did an excellent job using Patton Oswalt's character to explain the ancient legend. And I loved the sort of animation that they did with the ancient hieroglyphs explaining all of that, that was really well done because it was kind of a confusing storyline, but they concisely explained it um, in a way that was easy to understand and kind of fun. So we would be remiss if we didn't mention the dedication at the end of the movie. Um, This movie is dedicated to Ivan. It just says to Ivan, but we know it's Ivan Reitman. And he's the original film's director. Um, He died February 12th, 2022. Afterlife was dedicated to Harold Ramis, who played Egon Spangler. So it was really sweet how they dedicated the films to these men who really were monumental in the original film. So we liked how they did that. What were some of the other movies that Ivan Reitman was known for, Keith? Especially oh. from the 80s, there were a bunch. Oh, gosh. There was uh, Stripes, Twins, Heavy Metal. He had Dave, uh, Animal House, which creeps into the 70s. Mm-hmm. But, Classic. Uh, but Space Jam in the 90s with Michael Jordan. So, okay. I mean, that's some of them. I mean, that's a long laundry list of movies that he directed. Yeah. But I think Ghostbusters was really his legacy piece. Oh, yeah, for sure. And then his son, Jason, actually directed Afterlife. Yes, and 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 co-wrote both of them. Yeah, so he produced and co-wrote Frozen Empire, but he did not direct it because of his dad passing away. Right, so he was um, sort of like co-directing or co-producing it with someone called Gil Cannon, and Gil Cannon went on to direct it on his own um, after Reitman passed away, but... Uh, Jason, of course, helped write it, was very active in the entire thing. And these guys just did a fantastic job. The directing was great. The writing was was really well done. And uh, overall, we would we would definitely recommend seeing Ghostbusters. And, you know, a big movie like this, it is probably best to see it on the big screen. So if you get a chance, I would say go to the movie theater to see it. Definitely would. And if you go see it, or if you watch it at home, be sure and watch the credits because there is a, another nod to the Stay Puff characters. <laughs> yeah, right at the end. They always bring us, you know, in a little surprise. I saw some people getting up during the credits. They missed it. Well, and I knew they would because in Afterlife, there was quite a bit there was of a bunch in material. Yeah. yeah, so you want to stay at least partway through and you'll, you'll know when that is. Um, they'll have an extra little bonus clip that was kind of cute and fun. But overall, I'd say if you like the Ghostbusters franchise, definitely go see this one. It's worth it. Mm-hmm. Enjoyed it. You know, there was some things that could have been better, but hey, most movies have things that could be better. Oh, yeah. I mean, overall, we definitely don't want to downplay the fact that we we loved this movie. We thought it was fantastic. And we would recommend definitely watching Afterlife first before you see this one, yeah. if you in case you haven't seen it. Um, because it really picks right up where that one leaves off. Yeah, you might be a little confused if you haven't seen Afterlife. Right, with all the characters, yeah. I mean. So yeah. definitely do that. And, uh, you know, if there's something strange in your neighborhood. Who are you going to call? Ghostbusters. <laughs>